Assalamu alaikum, uh, guys. Welcome to episode 140 of Freshly Grounded. Are we good? Welcome to episode 140 of Freshly Grounded. This episode is with Ustad Yahya Al Rabi. Um, we had Ustad Yahya on the podcast about. Let me find the episode. That would be a good challenge. When did we have Ustad? Oh, I know how I can do it because it was one of the most popular ones. So I'll go to most popular. And it was episode 53. Wow, and this is episode 140 now. Episode 53 on April 2018. <laughs> April 2018. Uh, we had him here on the podcast and we got him back, alhamdulillah. And uh, it was amazing, as you guys would expect. Um, we spoke about um, this arrogance at the beginning. No, yeah, kind of like arrogance at the beginning, uh, but, uh, but, but humility. I think the main theme that is like transparent throughout the entire podcast, no matter what co- topics we touched on throughout, uh, the main theme would be, is hu- uh, the, the theme of humility uh but i'll let you guys listen to it uh and not uh, spoil it for you uh but just to say that if you're a fan of this kind of thing uh we have a patreon page um so you can become a patron of freshly grounded by going to patreon.com forward slash freshly grounded uh, or clicking the link in the bio uh, what it does by becoming a patron is you are able to su- it, you are able to support the podcast uh, more than anything you get every episode early so what happens now, the process of the podcast is as soon as I get off mic, we upload the um, audio almost instantly to Patreon, right? Whereas the video and the audio and everything else goes on um, about at, at least one day later on, on all other platforms. So if you want to get early access to all episodes, uh, head over to patreon.com. You also get a few other exclusives. We're trying to also add as many more as we can. Um, it's about five pounds a month it works out to, uh, but it makes a massive difference to us. Uh, and if everyone who listens to our podcast uh, was a patron, we would never need to try and find um private sponsors we would never need to go anywhere else and we could just focus on creating great content uh so it makes a massive difference Uh, and so if you're there thinking to yourself you know what i I hear him speaking about it all the time but i never actually do it um it would mean uh, a lot if you considered becoming a patron of freshly grounded uh with that being said guys without any further ado this is episode 140 with yahya al rabi and welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. The, no, after that bit, the brand new podcast. And after that bit, by best friends Faisal and Sam. Really? So as I was saying to you, kind of just before, just before about. Uh, I was saying that there's like the pers- a personality trait that I find really infectious and attractive um, in the sense that, attractive in the sense that like, it's just a nice personality trait to see in people. Um, and it's, it's, it's like the, tra- the personality trait of humility. And when a person, I'm gonna choose my words carefully, but when a person kind of talks down about themselves, not in a way where it becomes extreme and becomes like self-hate. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. But the trait where people are honest with themselves, they re- they reflect upon their own deeds before they reflect upon the deeds of others. And and uh, as I told you, I most recently I had met someone who was who who was very much so like that and you could tell he was very conscious of how he he was, he, was, he 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 focused so much on himself that he almost didn't have time to look at the faults of others. And I thought that it's so, it's so infectious seeing that. And it inspired me to maybe look look into myself a bit more. Subhanallah. Um, that's what you're referring to is humility, right? And uh, the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, he tells us in many a hadith that man rafa'ah, whoever humbles himself for Allah, you, know, you do this for Allah. It means that humility is not something that you do for mankind. It's not something you do to get any worldly gain or for you to praise you. No, it's for Allah. I.e. you're doing it for Allah in your heart. In your heart, you're only focused on Allah. Man tawadha lillah, whoever humbles himself for Allah Azza wa Jal, what happens? Rafa'ah. Allah elevates him. And khayru khalqillah, the best of creation, Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, he was the most humble. And subhanallah, now this statement that I said, Khairu Khalqillah, Khairu Bariya, the best of creation, a Sahabi, an Arabi, a Bedouin, he came to the Prophet Ali, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Khairu Bariya, he said, Oh, best of mankind. And you know the Prophet Ali, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, He said, Thaka Akhi Ibrahim, he said, Thaka Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he said, That's Ibrahim, alayhi salam, yani not me. And 
In fact, he is the best of creation. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa he would not have people uh, yani, uh, try to elevate him, etc. And, and on top of that, one time he was sitting on the Sahaba in a gathering like this. A sitting. And a man walked in. Okay. And then he saw the Prophet, alayhi wa sallam. And then what happened was he got startled. Because normally when you see a leader, a king, people get scared. So he thought the Prophet ﷺ was like that. So he got startled. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed that he got startled. So he said to him, He said, calm down, oh my brother. He said, I'm the son of a woman who used to eat the dry meat in Mecca. يعني, I'm come from a household of poverty. Wow. I'm nothing special about me. And uh, the Sahabi Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajri, رضي الله عنه, he adds to the end of this hadith in his narration, he, see, he adds the ayah that Allah says, نحن أعلم بما يقولون وما أنت عليهم بجبار فذكر بالقرآن من يخاف وعيد. Allah says, نحن أعلم we know ما يقولون what they are saying. وما أنت عليهم بجبار that you are not one who is arrogant with them. And the Messenger is the opposite of that. He is the most humble and the lenient, the most merciful to mankind. Then Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ So remind O Muhammad Ali with the Qur'an, the one who fears the torment or the punishment. And look at the link here. Allah Azza wa Jalla, after he mentioned that you are not arrogant, Allah mentioned the Qur'an. It is the Qur'an that humbles an individual. Because Allah says, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا Allah says that this is the, the home of the hereafter. A.e. Jannah That Allah has prepared for Those who do not want to be arrogant in the earth And no corruption And then Allah says وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And the Aqiba, Which is the end yani the, the, Those who are successful at the end It is for the muttaqin Those who are good conscious And it's taqwa that Allows you to be someone who Has Tawaba It all comes from It stems from fearing Allah The more you fear Allah wa ta'ala, The more you humble you will be For Allah because when Allah describes the believers, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةً أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ Subhanallah, imagine this. Allah says they are the ones, the believers, who give for the sake of Allah. Charity. طيب. Whatever they're given. And their hearts are wajila. Their hearts are trembling, afraid. Why? أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ Because they're going to return to Allah. طيب. What does this mean? This means that they do a righteous deed Which is now giving charity For Allah tabarak wa ta'ala And they are afraid yani They are afraid Is this act of worship going to be accepted from me? That's how the believer is He's in constant fear And that's what motivates him to do better And to do more and to do more and to do more But if you think that I'm the best My deeds are being accepted خلاص, You're never going to do anything And that's why Allah after he said that You know he says about them أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ those, those people يعني, that Allah described, they are the ones who strive in khayrat, in goodness. And وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ And they precede everyone to it. Because they have that trait of humility and they always think that my deeds, I'm afraid it's not accepted. So they keep striving, they keep striving. So they precede everyone when it comes to good, when you have that trait. So if you want to be ahead of everyone when it comes to goodness and khayr and a'mal al-saliha, righteous deeds, you need to have that trait in order to get there. And then what uh-huh. about the people who say that they... You know, I'm doing enough. I like, alhamdulillah. You know, I'm a good, I'm doing enough. Subhanallah. You, you, you know, it's very important. It's very important for the Muslim, I believe. Uh, and the scholars always encourage us that it's very important to look at the lives of those who preceded us. It's very important. You know why? First of all, uh, when you look at the lives of others who are righteous, who have passed away and who, and who left this world upon khair, upon goodness, it will lead you to benefit a lot from their lives, abundantly. Uh, and you start from the Messenger Muhammad Ali because he's the best example. And the Sahaba, okay, the, the Sahaba, the companions of the Messenger Ali So how were they, the Sahaba, when it came to this ideology? Amongst the Sahaba are those who were promised Jannah whilst they walk on the face of this earth. Huh? That's a great deal, isn't it? If one of us was promised Jannah right now, huh, what would our reaction be? Khalas, I don't have to do anything else. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. Uh, that's it. So those Sahaba who were promised Jannah, okay? Amongst them is Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet alayhi promised him Jannah on numerous occasions. That he's going to be amongst the people of Jannah. And look at Umar radiallahu anhu. 
he went to his sahabi known as Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiyallahu anhu arda and Hudayfa used to be the one who used to keep the secrets of the Prophet alayhi so he used to record all the secrets of the Prophet alayhi he tells him and amongst the secrets was that Allah used to inform the Prophet alayhi salam in Medina who the hypocrites were and the Prophet alayhi salam would tell Hudayfa and he would write it down for the Prophet alayhi so he used to have those he keep those secrets so Umar radiyallahu anhu one day he went to Hudayfa now imagine this he goes to Hudayfa and he says to him, <coughs> See, yeah, Hudayfa, he says, please, I'm going to ask you one question. Please help me out here. <laughs> Am I in that list of the hypocrites? Wow. Umar radiallahu anhu has been promised Jannah. Okay, the Prophet Ali Sultan has told numerous times and he's afraid he's amongst the hypocrites. Then how can I ever think that I'm up there? <laughs> how can I ever think that when those who are better than me, and I'm certain they're better than me, they were constantly afraid. Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abu Darda and many other Sahaba, their statements that reported from them, if Allah wa ta'ala, Abu Darda said this, if, if I knew that Allah Azza wa Jalla had accepted two rak'ahs that I prayed from me, it is more beloved to me and is better than this dunya and everything in it. Because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Because Allah Azza wa Jalla only accepts from those who have taqwa. That's how the Sahaba thought. So that's the mentality we're meant to have. We're meant to have good assumptions of Allah because you need that balance. To have good assumptions of Allah Azza wa because whatever you think of Allah, Allah will grant you it. As we have in Hadith Qusi, أنا عند ظني عبدي بي فليظن بما يشاء. I am what my servant thinks of me, Allah says. So let him think of me whatever he wishes. If he thinks good of me, Allah says, then he will attain it. And if he thinks bad of me, then he will attain that too. And in, in, the, in the life of the Prophet Ali sallam, it's evident that that happened. The Prophet Ali sallam, for example, uh, from the Sunnah, it is when someone's sick to visit them, mm. right? There are many fawaid benefits that come out of this when you visit the sick, and the Sunnah is to say when you visit someone who's sick, la ba astahur inshaAllah, that you make du'a for them and you say that you know to uh, to to be optimistic, etc. Say to them, you know, there's no harm upon you. Inshallah, there's a form, form of purification that Allah is forgiving your sins and He's elevating your status and granting reward, etc. Whilst you're sick, and to make them feel better. Uh, so the Prophet Ali one day he visited a man, an old man who was sick, and from his Sunnah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would say la ba astahur insha Allah. So he said that to the man, and this man he was very pessimistic. So what did he say? Bal nar tafur. He said rather you know, it's a fire that's burning an old man inside that's going to lead an old man to his grave. So he assumed bad of Allah wa taala right? Uh, the Prophet Ali left him. The son of that day did not set except that that man he died because of his statement. And he believed he had those assumptions of Allah Azza wa Jal, and that's what happened. So whatever you assume of Allah, you will, it will happen. Yani. So you need to have good assumptions of Allah and at the same time you strive and you do the good deeds and etc. And you're always afraid has Allah accepted. You know, you, you question uh, your sincerity and that doesn't also, you know, shouldn't go to extreme where it leads to doubting everything that you do as well. You have wiswas, you doubt everything that I do. And you question yourself in terms of how sincere what was I? You yeah, and you hold yourself accountable. That's what it means. And you hold yourself accountable before you are held accountable because you are going to be held accountable. You know our deeds that we do. We have angels that record it, right? We have an angel on the right that records all the good deeds, right? But the angels on the on the right, when they record our good deeds, they record every good deed that we do. Whether we're sincere or not, none of their business. And then those good deeds are presented to Allah. That the, all the good deeds are recorded. Okay? And then when they're presented to Allah Jalla wa Ala, Allah wa Ta'ala accepts some of them and rejects some of them. And because only Allah Azza knows those you are sincere in and those you're not sincere in. Even the angels don't know. And that's what Ibn Jawzi alayhi rahmatullah he says that sincere is mala yalamahu malakum fayaktubu. It's what an angel cannot know in order to write down. They just record the good deeds, but they don't know how sincere you are. And he says, Wala aduan And no enemy can know it in order to huh, corrupt it. Because it's the most precious thing that you have is your sincerity. If I knew you sincere and you are my enemy, I would want to corrupt it so you don't get anything accepted by Allah. And he says, Wala ya'ad. And this is the most important thing. This is our, coming to our point now, he mentions. Wala bihi sahibuhu he said, The person who is meant to have sincerity, he doesn't have self amazement. He doesn't think, Wow, I'm this, I'm that. Huh? And what does it do? It destroys the sincerity. And just the fact that you did that, it makes your deeds void. 
Allah understand. What about the person who has self amazement in other than the religion though? Like, so not in his good deeds, but for example, he he's like, you know what? I'm uh, like, I'm very good at this and that. Because I can foresee that that could mm. be an issue as well. Surely, it's, it's not. It's not a great issue. Yeah, it's uh, in dunya matters. In the matter of dunya, it is extremely recommended that the believer he does the best he can possible in it, and that he. Uh, demonstrates his ability to the best to to the best yani, that he can. But the matters of dunya and the matters of yani, if you if you a person cannot be two people, you can only have one character, mm. right? You can only have one personality, and yani, you can't be someone who's very arrogant and very uh, what's the word they use? Cocky. Haughty, I think. Is <laughs> yes, that word. Okay, you c- you can't be a person who has that trait when it comes to waters of the world, and then when it comes to akhirah or dunya, he changes all, of it and he's like, oh, miski, it doesn't work. Yeah. You only have one trait, so you should have twelve everywhere because your akhlaq should be consistent, your etiquette should be consistent, and rather people like the person who's humble when it comes to even dunya matters. The one, the one who's arrogant, nobody likes him. And humble does not mean that you're not confident. It's two different things. Yeah, confidence is required. Yeah. But confidence is something that stems from Allah. Look at the hadith of the Prophet Ali's Every the dua the Prophet Ali Sultan would say, he would say, Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghif, aslih li sha'ni kulla, wa la takilni ila nafsi tarfata'in. He say, Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, kulla from Allah. Okay, and some of the ulama, they say this is the greatest name of Allah. That whatever you ask Allah with, He'll grant you it. I seek your assistance through your mercy and your help through your mercy. And then the dua is Aslih li sha'ni kulla. This dua is great. So rectify for me all of my affairs. Wala takilni ila nafsi tarfata'in. And do not make me in charge of my affairs even a blink of an eye. Yani confidence. When it comes to thiqah, confidence is sent from Allah. The more you are attached to Allah, the more confident you should be. That's what it is. Because when you have Allah, wa ta'ala, it makes you more confident. For instance, an example. If you, uh, <laughs> did I tell you this? You know, a few weeks ago, I had a car accident. You didn't tell me. I didn't tell no you. No way. That. I had a very severe car accident. Subhanallah. And subh- subhanAllah, there's a great lesson that I learned from this car accident. I went to Milton Keynes. I delivered a khutbah there. Jum'ah And then You know now it's winter So Jum'ah and Asr are very close So after Jum'ah I waited We prayed Asr in the masjid And after Asr You know that uh, The morning adhkar It expires at Asr time So you need to renew your adhkar yani The evening adhkar At Asr time So what happened After Asr We prayed Asr I Straight after Salah I did adhkar al-masa The evening adhkar طيب. We left We went to uh, we're, I'm heading back to London Okay So uh, We're in the car And Basically, that is our fault. The brother who was driving, he hit a car in front of us and he hit the other, that car hit the car in front of it and that car hit the other car in front of it. It was a very serious car accident. But subhanAllah, the car was written off. It's finished. And if you saw the state of the car and how we came out, uh, it's completely different. The only thing that happened to me is I busted my lip. That was it. If you saw how it came out and how the car looked like, it's completely different. So I thought, first of all, Alhamdulillah, that Allah saved us. But I thought... This is the only experience I think that I've realized exactly that my adhkar that I recited after Asr protected me. And I was certain with that. A person who has that, Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, لَهُمْ عَقِبَاتٌ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهُ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ That Allah, He has angels that He sends to mankind. Okay? These angels... There are two angels that are on your left and right that are recording the deeds. And the believer, he has angels, one in front of him and one behind him. Allah says, يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ They are what? They are protecting him from the command of Allah. Any harm. Right? When you do adhkar, for instance, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي لَا يَضُرُّ مَعَ اسْمِهِ شَيْءٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَهُوَ سَمِيُّ الْعَلِيمِ You just say that three times in the morning, three times in the evening. In the name of Allah, that nothing harms us in the heavens and the earth. Okay? And with his name, nothing harms. And he's the, the all-hearing, the all-knowing. When you say that, Allah Ta'ala sends angels who have weapons, who are guarding you. Huh? Is anything going to harm you that day? So a person who has connection to Allah Ta'ala, he's a person who is confident. Whoever prays Salat al-Fajr in jama'ah, فَهُوَ فِي ذِمَّةِ اللَّهِ He is in the protection of Allah. Yani these are the things that grant you confidence. 
That's what makes you more confident. The more you're attached to Allah, the more confidence you should have. That's how it is. And that confidence is in Allah. Right? Thiqa mm. billah. That's how the believer is. Now. I want to... I'm, I'm, I, it's kind of interesting. That first of all, I, I can't believe you didn't tell me about that car accident. Oh, I just dropped you, know, I, I, so you know, the crazy thing is, <laughs> it happened on Friday and Saturday I came to bed. <laughs> And straight after actually the, the, I was going back to London Because I had a wedding to attend I was doing a wedding So I had to get there And I was stuck on the M25 For about three three hours Oh M25 is the worst It's the worst the It worst. was like shut off the M25 There's no one I can go We're standing on the, the hard shoulder Nowhere to go Eventually the, alhamdulillah Allah sent the police And they came And then when they investigated They took us somewhere That I could Order an Uber Or something like that So someone could pick me up And then So some brothers came I wasn't too far from London When this happened So Alhamdulillah It worked out You should have rang me I'm, I need it would have been hard for you to get there because there was so much traffic. Mm. It would have taken ages to get to me. So it was better for me to get off there and to get to where I needed to go. But subhanAllah, I went to a wedding and uh, I had I was wearing white thumb when this all happened. So because my 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 lip hit the it hit the chair in front of me and I it, it, it was bleeding. So I got blood on my white thumb. So I had like blood stains here. But obviously I had a, I had a red chimag I was wearing. So what I did was I covered it here and I went to the wedding and I acted like everything was okay. Did they know that you had it just come from a car accident? No, no, no. I didn't tell them. After after the wedding and everything was done, I told them, by the way, I had, had a car accident, but alhamdulillah, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Subhanallah. Allah was sad. But alhamdulillah. Yani it's, uh, and it, it, it was scary, but yani, uh, the, the point here and the lesson here is, is that the importance of the car. The importance of the car. It's so very important. And the importance of doing it as soon as the time of the car starts. And in the mornings after Salat al-Fajr or Fajr time and the evenings after time, do not ever take it lightly. It's very important. It's like you're putting uh, yourself in, at harm, in harm's way, mm. right? Even if you can't do all the adhkar, do some of them, it's better than nothing. You know, uh, it's it, very important, you know, and that's why it's very important to memorize the adhkar because then you won't feel like it's a, it's a burden. Some people, you know, um, you have to get your app out or you have to get your book out and that's, you know, they feel like it's a burden. Yeah. But if you have memorized it, you won't even have to do anything. You're literally just walking wherever you are, you're saying the adhkar. Mm. E- and I advise people to start with the short ones. You know, the ones that are the very short, memorize them. Uh, and they have great virtues. You say this three times in the morning or the evening And when you say this The Prophet Ali tells us That Allah Ta'ala will please that person Or Allah will be pleased with him يعني, What else could you want? Subhanallah I, I remember like Maybe like five, six years ago When Idris told me the importance of Adqar Since then Mm-hmm. It's the what I can't function. I have to, like, no matter what. And there's been times, very rarely, where, you know, like, for example, you pray your asr, like, you're, you're in a way or something, you pray your asr, and then you're straight into a car, and you think, okay, I'll do it while I'm in a car. And then, uh, like, uh, some time goes past, and you think, subhanAllah, I haven't, like, I don't feel protected. Like, you don't feel like you're wearing yeah. your clothes. So, the Asqar, um, I, I remember when I first uh, did the episode with Sheikh Tim Humble in Dubai, and I said to him, he was like, uh, I think I, I was telling him some of the topics that I wanted to discuss. And the main one I said, I said, oh, we want to talk about the car and the importance of it. Because obviously he specializes in Rukia and stuff. And I wanted to, to discuss it. So we, we got that in that episode. And so inshallah, he was able to like really like talk about the importance of it. Um, the, the, I, I want to kind of shift a bit into um, on the topic of uh, just you. Uh, uh-uh. <laughs> I know you hate it. <laughs> but well, but before you go before yeah. you go there, I just want to say one thing. You know, uh, it's very common in the Muslim community that uh, whenever something happens to someone something happens to someone, okay, we tend to blame evil eye. We tend to blame uh, the, the you know, stuff like this. But you know the ulama, you know what they say. If or we tend to think that, you know, when we uh, something happens to us, you know, it's evil eye or people are jealous of me, etc. Uh, uh, some of the ulama they say that if this happens to you, this is a qadr of Allah, no doubt. It's a decree of Allah, wa ta'ala, if this happens to you. But uh, it has a cause. And uh, if this happens, then know that it is because you have shortcomings when it comes to your adhkar. You know the adhkar? The adhkar are fortress. It's like, you know, a brick wall. Okay, you have a wall here that you put in the other day, right? Yeah. Okay, it's quite thin, isn't it? Yeah. Like, that wall. It's probably it's easy for me to break through it, right? Sheikh, you're, you're a powerful man, yeah. But this wall is this wall is strong, guys, isn't it? Correct. So it would be more difficult for me to 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 break through this wall. Sorry. The adhkar, the more adhkar you do, the thicker that wall gets, 
and it will be harder for anything anything to break through it. The less adhkar you do, the thinner that wall is, and it will be easy for the evil to get through to it. So the more adhkar you do, it is what protects you more. And that's why the adhkar, the kirin Allah kathiran that Allah he describes in the Quran, those who remember Allah Azza wa a lot, and those males who are females who remember Allah Azza wa a lot. What makes you from those? Allah says, Add Allah lahum maghfiratan, Allah prepared for them forgiveness. And great reward. And when Allah, when Allah doesn't specify the reward, it shows how great it is. What makes you from amongst those that in Allah? The ulama they say the one who observes the morning and evening remembrance, he he that's number one. The adhkar after the salawat. Okay, after each salah, the adhkar that you recite, okay, and you'll find them in all fortress of Muslim, etc. Okay, whoever wants to find them. And the adhkar for daily matters. For instance, you wake up, you say, Alhamdulillah Ladi Ahyana Ba'dama Amatana wa ilahi nushur. Ah. When you're going to sleep, when you're eating, you say Bismillah. When you finish, you say Alhamdulillah. When you leave your house, you say Bismillah. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And so on. You get into the car. Subhanallah, the sakharna, etc. Right. Every instance, you go into the toilet. You come out. To, you know. You say the dhikr. When you are someone who does that, you will be amongst those Allah described that remember those who remember Allah Azza wa Jal a lot. Right. That Allah prepared for the forgiveness. And a great reward. So that's the, and the thing is that you need to try. The believer should try to make this, um, his like he just does it as if it's an instinct. He doesn't have to think about doing it. You know, he gets into the car as soon as he feels he's in the car. He says, Subhanallah, he says he gets into the house. Bismillah, he walajn. Bismillah, kharaj now. Ya Rabbi, na tawakal. He gets out. Bismillah, tawakal. Allah. Ah, he's about it. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, etc. And because it is easy to forget, no doubt. And we human beings, we forget. But when you make it a habit and etc., you do it without even thinking about it. Now. Uh, did I make you forget? Because I hope I no, didn't no, make you forget. No, you didn't. You tried though, you didn't. Uh, you're, when you were last on the podcast, which was, uh, how long ago was that? Like two years? It's been a very long time. <coughs> last, last time you were on the podcast, we discussed a bit about your story in uh, or your journey just generally. Um, like, for example... Uh, coming over to the UK, we spoke about your British accent and stuff. Yes, uh, and but you know, every, I, I still get questions regarding that, and uh, I'm like, oh, it's a long story. Where do I start? <laughs> you should tell them to refer back to I, the I, I tell them, <laughs> I tell them, if you want to find the story in details, they refer back to the episode. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, mashallah, just, advertisement. <laughs> just like a long head, we need it. Um, but I said, uh, we didn't delve too much on your journey with the Quran with regards to like, um, and kind of as the years have gone on, I've uh, you know, had the um, you know honor of of hearing various stories from you, from your life and your childhood and stuff, from yourself. And um, I'm intrigued for the people listening about your journey when it came to um, like your hips and stuff, because you um, you you took a passion from it from early, and you also had um, the same kind of distractions or <clears throat> like barriers that, 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 that a lot of us have or a lot of people have right which is that for example you went through phases of okay my teacher's away for a few weeks like I can relax a bit <laughs> and and stuff like that and then you and then some things woke you up a bit and some and and what you thought oh no I have to get serious now and other times you um struggled like you mentioned to me before that you uh, your first few years were a lot slower than than, than the the, the the latter years and there was times w in which you became more serious about it and uh, and and you but but your ability to memorize was was always good or, 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 or got, uh, got increasingly a lot better mm -hmm. but it wasn't your ability that um that that slowed you down but it was the the re sometimes you relaxed a bit so can we hear a bit about that journey about like memorizing and kind of the 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 the, the peaks and uh, and trumps of that mm, deep. you know and the Quran, Kalam Allah Taala, is the greatest ni'mah that an individual Allah Taala can uh, bestow upon. And Alhamdulillah, and we ask Allah Taala to allow us to be amongst the people of the Quran, those who learn it and understand it and act upon it, because the Quran is a great ni'mah. It's from out of this world, right? And the fact that Allah grants you an opportunity to be able to study His speech, okay, and to be able to memorize it, and you contain it. In your heart, it's a great ni'mah. The Messenger Ali Salatam tells us, In Allah, la yu adhibu qalban wa'a al Qur'ana. That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala does not punish. Look at this statement. Verily, Allah jalla fi ulahu will not punish a heart that contains the Qur'an. 
Quran in Arabic language, it means a container. Okay, what does it mean? That the Quran has sunk into the heart of the believer, that he loves it. He finds sweetness in the Quran. He uh, acts upon the Quran. He it protects him from haram. If it stops him from doing things that Allah Azza is not pleased with, and it motivates him to do good, that's a heart that has contained the Quran. They lived the Quran. They breathed the Quran. Everything is the Quran. As the poet he says, "Faqoo ruhi arwahul maani, wa lisa bi antaimta wa la sharibta." That's the food of the soul, the nourishment of the soul. It is. That spiritual food, the Quran, the Sunnah of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, that is the food of the soul. That even if you don't eat and drink, it will be sufficient for you. You find some of the ulama, subhanallah, that they will be so immersed in deen and studying, etc., they will forget to eat and drink. They will forget literally. Actually, one of the mashayikh, he mentioned that he would, subhanallah, <coughs> uh, back in where, where he came from, yani our home country, he says that obviously, you know, the, the, back then there was no refrigerators and stuff like that. So lunch would be made at a specific time and there's no microwaves to heat it up. So if it gets cold, that's it. Yani, it's not very nice to eat, is it? You can't heat it up. So lunch is made at a specific time, so everyone would be called to have lunch. Okay, so who'd be up there? Quran, 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 and then he forget about lunch. He, he doesn't. He, he can't even feel the hunger because he feels like that he's been nourished by something else. Subhanallah, because it's the food of the soul. Allah says, min amrina. Allah describes the Quran as a ruh. طيب. And Allah says, وقال, uh, uh, Allah Azza wa He says that He placed بل هو آيات بينات في صدور الذين أوتوا العلم. The Quran is in the chest, right? So it is extremely important that the individual he takes he tries to learn the book of Allah wa ta'ala. He takes a step to try whatever he can and Allah wa ta'ala you know will not burden you with anything more that you can uh, you know, bear. And uh, it's, uh, m- everyone can try, especially when you're young. The Sahaba this is what moves me to be the most. The Sahaba when Islam came, all of them were adults, the majority of them were adults. But a lot of them in their old age memorize the book of Allah. Right, so it's not about age; it is about you being motivated and driven to do it. So, Alhamdulillah, yani, uh, from a young age, as I mentioned before on the previous podcast, I won't get too much into it, but it was it was the customs of our uh, of my family uh, to take you as a young child to learn Quran in the madrasa as young. So I started when I was about six or something like that, t- t- five or six, take it to a madrasa, or well, maybe younger. I can't remember, but obviously that period of my time it was not serious. Uh, it's just going there. You have no idea why you're going there. But when I got to about 11 or so, uh, this is when uh, I started to love it. Because at that age, I was going, to, uh, the masjid was only five minutes away from my house. So I used to walk there. And I used to go to the masjid for the salawat. And actually at that age, I used to be, I used to call the adhan for the salawat. So that's why I used to go like half an hour be- before every salah. I used to be at the masjid. At, at six years old? No, 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 at, at the age of 11. Okay. At the age of not six, six is very young. Okay, 11, yeah. 11, 12. Mm-hmm. I used to go to the masjid and subhanAllah, I, was, I always thought to myself, so may, perhaps I was more mature for my age and I was always taller than my age group. <laughs> so I looked a bit older than, not my face, but I was a bit taller than, than those my age. So at 11, 12, I would go to the masjid and I'll go there half an hour before every salah because 15 minutes before every salah, I would do the adhan. So doing the adhan, this is when I discovered that I could do something with my voice. <laughs> this is what I, I started trying different things, trying to imitate the haram, mm-hmm. you know, the adhan haram. Uh, how, how does it go? The adhan Ali Mullah. I used to try to copy Ali Mullah, uh, the muaddin Farooq al Hadrawi, who had a very big voice, and I didn't have the same voice as him. He has a very deep voice. And Sheikh Muhammad Ali Shakir, who was still muaddin and haram, and so on. I used to try to imitate their, their voices and do the adhan, you know, their voices. And this is when I tried to do the things, and, tr- and then I started imitating different qurra, and this is where it started. Different reciters. And when I started imitating different reciters, I started to love Quran. So I remember from the people I used to imitate, it was obviously everyone starts off with the Aimma, the Imams of the Haram, right? Sheikh. Uh, I never used to go to the mainstream people like Sudeh Sushraim. I never used to do that. I used to try those other people who weren't as known, like Sheikh Salah al Budair, who was Imam Mishnah Nabawi, and uh, Sheikh Maher Ma'iqli. Uh, who was Imam Masjid Haram, Sheikh Abdullah Awad al Juhani, who was Imam Masjid Haram as well, and so on. I used to, even Sheikh Saad al Ghamidi, I used to imitate him, Sheikh Hudayfi. Uh, so all of them, I used to imitate them, and I wasn't very bad at it. 
I've never heard you imitate. Uh, I don't. I don't do it anymore. Really? I don't, that was but maybe uh, in private gallery. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. But <laughs> Subhanallah, that's what really got me to love huh, the Quran and so on. Because now I'm I list all these sites and I can find myself. So at that young age, you don't know. You, you know. You, you don't understand the Quran. I didn't know Arabic at the time. So this is what made you want to take the step. So Alhamdulillah, at that time that I had this passion for Quran, Allah Taala sent us uh, my Sheikh. Okay, Sheikh Ismail. Uh, he came at that time And he just had A year before that He had graduated from Jamia Islamia Medina Okay And he graduated from Faculty of the Quran So he was a, he was a person who Has ijazah in the Quran He has ijazah in all the 10 qiraat of the Quran And he came to the community And our community in West London Okay I can tell you that He is the pioneer When it comes to Teaching the science of the Quran Everyone Literally everyone who's half in our area studied under him. Uh, all the Hufav in my area, all the Aimma you see in our masjid and the other masajid who leave Tarawih, etc. All they are all his students, and until this day, his students have students, and he's made he's created a generation of students of Quran. And Subhanallah, going back to the topic that we mentioned earlier on, so we're talking about earlier on, which is humility. Subhanallah, I have not seen a person who's more humble than him. Um, yani from my real life experiences, yani. They are no doubt people who are a lot of humility, but from what I experienced, well, there was a time that the students of the Sheikh, us, we all he, the Sheikh he encouraged us all to take part in a Quran competition. So we took part in a Quran competition, and a lot of us got yeah, you know, first prize, second prize, etc. And yeah, you know, we we kind of dominated the the competition. So after the, 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 the when the ceremony, the the war ceremony was happening, uh, I introduced uh, the Sheikh to. Um, to some of the the mashayikh that were organizing this Quran competition. So I said, this is our Sheikh, Sheikh Ismail, he's Khadid Jam Islamiya, he has a Mujaz in Qarat, etc. I just mentioned some, these are all facts. What I said were facts. I didn't say anything that was not true. And our Sheikh, okay, he's a person, and everyone who knows him knows this, okay, he's a person who does not show emotion. He doesn't show emotion. And to be, to be honest, he was very stern with us. I used to be frightened of him when I started the Quran with him because he was so stern. And he never used to like to show emotion. No, this is, it's just his nature. He never used to show emotion. And uh, he used to be very, like, because well, I was young at the time, so he was very harsh with me, etc., to get me, to push me, to motivate me. So that kind of did help me, to be honest. And subhanAllah, when I, as I got older, I actually realized that he's actually the best person ever. <laughs> he just used to be like that to motivate me and to... Some people, different things work. So it's a different technique that he used to use. So he never used to show emotion. But subhanAllah, that day when I said that statement, uh, I saw Sheikh Ismail cry. And he really disliked what I said. And he got really upset. And he said, you know, uh, he, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he started muttering things under his breath. And then he uh, got really agitated and he, and he started to cry. And he just he walked away from the whole scene. He didn't want anyone to see him and he walked away. And I saw Subhanallah, yani Sheikh, and he um, he put his and he said, I'm 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 I'm, not, I'm none of that, or something like that. And he said, don't ever. He, and, he, and he told me off. He said, don't ever do anything like that ever again. He said, don't ever do anything like that ever again. And he really told me off about that. So, uh, yani it's going uh, and it's going back to the fact that the Quran, that is what, yani the, this person who is a Sheikh who has yani produced all these. And her father, the people who are carriers of the Quran, who memorize the book of Allah uh, uh, يعني, he deserves that, but he does not see himself as someone who deserves that. And Jazakallah Khair, but I'm going to mention him here because he deserves it and uh, he is a legend. <laughs> he isn't he's a living legend and he's 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 still around and he's still, you know he used to come seven days a week. And he lives in East London and we live in West London. He used to commute. Seven days a week, and he'll sit in the masjid from salat after Salat al Asr, all the way to after Salat al Isha, and he'll have halaqa of so many people in the masjid. This is back on the masjid before the masjid was built, you know, re- uh, rebuilt. It used to be smaller. So the whole downstairs, the ground floor, used to be full of people. Every corner, everyone's reading the Quran. The whole masjid was full of Quran, subhanAllah. Every corner, you have adults, elders, you have young people, you have uh, people who are middle aged. Every type of uh, society and everyone used to be frightened of him. Just even those who were elder were scared of him because he had that haba, he had that awe. SubhanAllah, Allah Ta'ala, he granted him until this day and he has that all. Allah Akbar. But anyway, um, Sheikh Ismail, Allah sent him to us. And then then uh, I started the Quran with him and we start, and I started reciting to him. And at the beginning, I found it very difficult. So I remember one day, okay, I, I was, I was because he made, I remember my three juzes at that time, but he made me start from the beginning again to learn the Quran with Tajweed. So one day I was, I was reciting Surah Al-Masad, okay? And Surah Al-Masad, when I started it, I thought, you know, maybe I never ever tried, you know, to recite the Quran in a nice voice or try to beautify my voice when I recited Sheikh Ismail because I was really scared. 
I was really scared to do it. So I used to recite in monotone. I used to recite him. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Like that. That's how I used to recite when I used to recite him. Just to get the hakam. So one day I, when I got Surat Masjid, I thought I was a bit brave. I got a bit brave. So I, I, I tried to recite uh, Surat Al Masjid uh, like Mahir Al Makli. Okay? So I started the, uh, after this man, I said, Tabbat. I said, I did this. Tabbat yada abi lahabi wa tab. ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب. I did that. As soon as I got the second, I told me stop. And he told me, what are you doing? He said to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I'm reading Quran. He said, I want you to only listen to Al Husari or Min Shawi. No one else. Really? Who told you to listen to Muaykli? Uh, Muaykli, listen to you in your own time. Want you learn the Quran? Only Husari or Min Shawi. <laughs> and then I was like, from that day on, I went back to monotone until I got to Surah Tahrim, which is like three after just Tabarak, start Surah Tahrim. This is the day that uh, Sheikh Ismail, because he knows I was able to do stuff with my voice. So then he, when I got to the ayah, Ya ayyuha al-Nabiyu jahidi al-Kuffara wal-Munafiqeena waghlud alayhim. Okay, I got to the ayah. Sheikh Ismail, he, he recited the ayah in his voice. Okay, he said, and his voice was very nice. And it still is very nice. And I used to imitate him as well. And he says, Ya ayyuha al-Nabiyu jahidi al-Kuffara wal-Munafiqeena waghlud alayhim. وَمَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ He recited like that, he said, okay, carry on with that voice he told me. So I carried, because he knew I could imitate him, so I carried on with the same voice. مَرَضَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا امْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَامْرَأَةَ لُوطٍ كانت تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما. I carried on like that. So from that day onwards, I uh, was now encouraged to um, to recite Quran with a nice voice. So Alhamdulillah, يعني, um, we had our ups and downs and we struggled sometimes. And sometimes you'd be um, really motivated at the beginning. I found it difficult. As Saudi, the first five juz of the Quran, I found found quite hard to memorize. But after five juz. Allah Azza wa Jalla made it easy, and uh, I was memorizing, uh, and he appeared in about ten minutes. And it was Allah Tabarak wa Taala. He made it easy for me. Uh, but Subhanallah, when it was hard, I was working very hard, <laughs> because obviously I knew that it required a lot of work for me. So I would put in a lot of work, a lot of time. But then when it got easy, I started to lay back, because <laughs> I thought, leave it to last minute, and that's bad. What, where, where were you probably at this point in the, in the Quran? So uh, five juz, so six juz. Okay, fine. So from the from Ahqaf onwards, okay. Surah Ahqaf onwards. This is when I and the, uh, the and the Hawamim and so on. This is when I started to lay back and I thought, uh, you know, you can just save it to the day before you go to Sheikh and you can memorize like three, four pages and that's enough for you. Mm. When I could have done more, mm. right? Because when I so, and then when the Sheikh the Sheikh he knew he saw my ability that I was able to memorize a lot. He said, "What are you doing with your life?" He said to me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Sheikh. And then he kind of, you know, told me, look, he motivated me and he gave me some words of encouragement and so on. And then then I got so encouraged. So what did I do? I started to memorize every day and then I'll go to him with 10 pages as half a juzit. So I can do like half wow. half a juzit in like in a week. And then I'll go to him all the time, 15 pages. And then I flew, right? And then I slowed down again, you know, because you go up and down and you go phases in your life, etc. And at the same time, I was a student, I was studying at the same time. So it's not like all my life is this, but um, you try to give it as much time as possible. I used to have a mushaf and I still have the mushaf to, to the day. And it's very important that the person learning Quran, he has one mushaf he memorizes from. It's very important. You only learn from one mushaf because the mushaf, they differ in the number of ayat that are on a page. Okay, because when you're memorizing, you're memorizing, you're have, you have a picture in your head of the page, mm-hmm. right? I used to have a little A5 size mushaf, and I used to keep it inside my jacket at all times. I used to keep it with me all times. Okay, and that mushaf, now the back cover is gone. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so old. And I used to have so many like uh, pencil marks on the mushaf because the sheikh, what he used to do was, and he, whenever I make a mistake in tajweed or make a haraka mistake, whatever mistake that I make, he will underline it for me, he will circle it for me, whatever. He, so that when I read it again, I know where I went wrong. So I don't make the mistakes again. So I rectify my mistakes. Right, and that's very important. And so I used to read that mushaf with me and I used to take it with me everywhere. So try to memorize as much as possible. 
uh, wherever I am, but it went up and down now. And that's the, this is like Iman. Iman goes up and down, your juhd goes up and down. But it's, it's a matter of being consistent and persevering and trying to get there. You have an end goal. At the end of the day, no matter what, I was never going to stop memorizing Quran because I wanted to finish the Quran. That was always a goal. When you have a goal, no matter what happens, you go up and down, you always keep your eye on the goal and that's what keeps you going. How, how do you get that discipline then? Because you said that, you know, there was a phase where you would think, all right, the night before the, I see the Sheikh, I'll um, recite to him. And um, uh, sorry, I memorized the night before. Why a Why do we become like that? Mm-hmm. And then B. What did you do to get that discipline back, or, or or like build that discipline up? Because motivation, like I understand that motivation does that. But motivation lasts only so long. So, okay, that's very good. Okay, this there are certain factors that kept me going. Okay, amongst them, it is my peers. You know, having people around you. Who are uh, heading towards the same goal? It's very important, and this is what the Prophet Ali saw to the Sahaba, and he encouraged the Sahaba to do. The Sahaba they used to, uh, they used to compete in goodness in khair, and mm-hmm. it's good to compete in khair. So my peers, we used to compete in who would pre- uh, pass the other one in terms of surah. <laughs> yani. So I remember there was like a bunch of us, and we were around the same area. So who's going to be? So sometimes one of them will go away, and he'll memorize so much, he'll come back the next week, he's passed you. So you get annoyed, like. I was ahead of you. How did you manage to get catch up to me? So, you know, it's the, it's this competition spirit. You know that spirit. Of, I I want to beat everyone else, right? If you're very competitive, this is perfect for you, okay? <laughs> because you're gonna do whatever it takes to get there, and it's good, and you're getting to your goal. So, one of the things my sheikh he said to me, he said to me, look, this person who came after you and he's passed you, and that used to burn me inside. <laughs> so I'll go and that's it. I've lost it. I'm not competitive at all. <laughs> I don't consider myself competitive, but it hurts when someone comes who came after you Sorry. and he's no past you, right? No. And that shows how lazy you were yeah. and yani, how um, and easygoing you've become, right? Yeah. So it kind of gives you a wake up call. Like this person, yani, he's come after me. He hasn't done something that's significantly great, but he's just done the minimum and he's past you. So that I'll go home and I'll be so upset. So I'll lock myself in my room. And my family know now not to disturb me. <laughs> He's uh, now he's he's what they say on it. Yeah, he's on it. <laughs> so I would go and WhatsApp and I'd be going. Uh, all they can hear is buzzing in my room. I'm just repeating and I and you know you've seen when people memorize the Quran they tend to shake themselves. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Allah. I don't know where that comes from, but it just happens when you move yourself. You think that <laughs> you know yeah. it, it goes in. So you just uh, what I'll do is sometimes I'll be walking up and down the hallway and I'll be memorizing and I'll just be sick and my family think he's 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 lost it. So my grandma. <laughs> Uh, you know, my grandma, she was memorizing the Quran at the same time as me. You know, I think I remember, I mentioned this last time. Oh, you did, yeah. Yeah, she's memorizing the Quran at the same time as me. So she would always ask me where I am in the Quran. She would ask me what story you're on. And obviously, she was memorizing the Quran for 20 years and she finished it uh, in 2012. She started in, and in, 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 when she came to the UK. It took her a long time. But she always used to ask me, okay, where are you now? What story you on? So, once she sees, and this is one of the things that, other things that motivated me. Once she sees that I haven't moved much, she said to me, I've done better than that. Yeah. <laughs> she was saying to me, she was like, come on. She was, she was saying things like, you know, she used to say like, you're, like, you're, the, you're the future sheikh of our, our, our family. Don't let <laughs> us down. She would say stuff like that. She, you know, she, was, she would say, look, you come from a family. She, she would say it's like a stuff to do. You come from a family of oh, scholars and sheikhs. You know, you can't be the one who lets them all down. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. I want to say next time, I want to hear you on Baqarah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She always used to ask me. And my, some of my cousins as well, they were in Egypt and they were memorizing the Quran. And some of them, they, uh, they, they'd pass me. She's like, he's on that surah and you're on that. What's wrong with you? Come on, Yahya. You're always at the masjid. You, know, you need yeah. to do more. <laughs> so that used to keep me going. And I want to wait to you. Um, and the other thing is that, and this is the most important one, I believe, that um, the more you, the more you, uh, you, know, you, you learn about the Quran, the more you study the Quran, and I'm not, I'm not talking about in terms of memorization, in terms of understanding the, the contents of the Quran, and this, the ayat of the Quran, what they mean. Um, and it really resonates with you, and you see, the, and at a young age, you think, subhanAllah, and I had no idea that these ayat that I had memorized a while back, that they had this great meaning, and they entailed this great meaning. When you understand the meaning of the Quran, and at the same time, obviously, I was learning Arabic, it... Um, Gave me, subhanAllah, yani, a great appreciation of the Quran. That's, you know, you're, you're 
halfway through or you've got you know you've done a, a great portion of the Quran that you memorized and uh, subhanallah Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and now he's allowed you to understand some of that which you have memorized and it's subhanallah and the expression is subhanallah and it's uh, absolutely absolutely amazing when you understand the Quran because when you understand the Quran it has this ladha which is something yani ladha is enjoyment and, uh, and the sweetness of the Quran that he doesn't have when he just uh, recited and subhanallah you know the Quran when you don't understand it it has an effect of you, on you right when you just hear the Quran it's someone who recites the Quran with a nice voice and you have no idea what he's, what he's reciting it affects you mm-hmm. does not it mm-hmm. affects your heart because it's the kalam of Allah so that's the effect it has on you when you don't understand it imagine the effect it has on you when you understand it the effect is even greater and you think subhanallah yani, why have I not memorized all of this so I can recite it I can recite it all the time from my memory Because you feel, you feel that sweetness and that enjoyment in your heart Wallahi um, some, When we were learning Arabic Some of the students who were studying with us I remember one of, one of my, my friends I remember one time he was reading the recital Sheikh Ismail And now we had got to a stage where We had come close to completing the Quran And we were getting towards the end And he was reciting before me And I was waiting in line And uh, he recited the Sheikh I can't remember what story it was but as he recited, he was fighting, and then he just broke down, and he started crying. And then, and la shak that these ayat that he's reciting, they are mu'athir, they are very effective. I mean, they were ayat that, uh, and no doubt that people are affected by different ayat, depending on what stage in your life that you're going through. And the Qur'an addresses every single part of that. Every part of your life, everything you're going through, the Qur'an addresses it. So he broke down, and he started crying. And uh, subhanAllah, I mean, the, um, the, the reason why he broke down is because he understood what he was reciting. But if you do not understand, understand, you're just like a parrot repeating things that you have memorized, right? And that's why it's very important that the individual, when he's learning the Quran, he also learns the meaning of the Quran. He learns, he tries to, to a certain extent. Obviously, you can't understand all of the Quran. It requires deep understanding, and it also requires a teacher to, to teach you tafsir and so on. But to look over the meaning, generally, look at the tafsir of the ulama, simple tafsir like tafsir al-Sa'di, or even there's another one called Mukhtasar tafsir summarized tafsir by Marcus Tafsir in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia they have made they just tell you the general meaning of each ayat and at the end of each page they tell you the benefits that are extracted from these ayat and so on but these are in Arabic uh, I believe that it is being translated to, uh, to the English language I saw this like two years ago that they translated to English language and I hope uh, hopefully by now that they have uh, finished translating it but I, I, uh, talking about the Quran is it's, it's, a, it's a subject that never ends, mm. and uh, I don't want I don't want to end up lecturing uh, our viewers no, no, no. Uh, about the Quran because I'm I'm, I'm sure that my horse died. I think the I think he said there's something happened to the batteries. Should we take a quick break? So you spoke about your grandma during you memorize in Quran how much of an effect did your father have my father my father my father is uh, hafizahullah my father he is all about education and he is the most supportive individual that I know when it comes to education whatever you learn my dad he says whatever it may be it will benefit you uh, at some point in your life And he always used to push us Me and my siblings To learn, to learn Especially when he came to deen uh, Academic studies All of that And my dad He was also one of those people Who used to ask me like oh, Sorry or now and, and then I'll tell him And he'd be like Come on <laughs> You know but, but my, It's very hard to please my dad It's very hard to please him and he's Because he always wants the best for you and I totally understand that. And he always wants you to have lofty aspirations. And that's how the believer is. He should have lofty aspirations. And when he does something, he tries to do the, be- be the best at it. And if instance, my sister, my sister would come home and she would get like a really high grade. And then my, da- my dad would say, he, he, instead of congratulating her, <laughs> it's very funny. He would say things like, okay, how many people in your class got the same grade as you? And she would say, she would, say, oh, so that, that she would, she would list a few people. She, and he would say, okay, you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he wants you to be the best, yani, mm-hmm. better than everyone else. That's, and that's how every parent wants for their child. So he's, um, he's very supportive and he's always you know, supportive me. And he's, he's always um, 
and be them both my parents my mom and my dad and subhanallah i believe and uh, after allah tabarak wa ta'ala it is yani, their their support and their duas and their encouragement yani, that i ma- managed to achieve and yani, some of the stuff that I, uh, that uh, all the, uh, not some of the stuff but all the stuff that i achieved in my life uh, they are the force behind it because your parents dua as a messenger ali sallallahu he tells us that dua of your parents is always accepted the dua the parents he makes for his child is always accepted okay so imagine your mother okay and the custom of the mother in, in, in my community and I, most muslims is every time your mother she she just make dua for you you know she would make dua for you she say you know and, and she'll say in somali obviously uh, may Allah grant you whatever you wish May Allah etc Put only khair in front of you May Allah protect you from all your enemies And so like that She always make dua like that And my dad was always the one who would advise us He would be like He would always ask us about the d- details of our life Okay my dad he always he's, so He would sit to all my siblings and ask us about the details of our life And he would advise us on very very sensitive matters and so on And he would give us you know guidance on them and so on So he played a very big role when it came to that In doing the right thing When it came to your life and your future and so on So Jazakumullah khair uh, My father now He's 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 moved away. He's moved to Somalia. He actually moved a month, really, a few weeks ago. He's now he's he's moved there. So now, it's quite, it's, he he's he's yeah he's kalas. He <laughs> does not want to be here anymore. He's had enough. So he's he's moved away. So now it's just contacting him over phone, you know, oh. over WhatsApp call. So you don't get to see him much, unfortunately. Subhanallah. You know you you realize, yani the the blessing of just having your parents with you, you know, after they leave you. And you know that you're not going to see them for a while. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's quite difficult. They'd Do you travel it. back to Somalia much? I don't. I've only been there once in my life, and that's 2015. But now my father being there, I'm going to have to go there a lot now. Mm. So I'm hopefully, I'm home planning, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah make it easy, but mm. I have to go there, inshallah ta'ala. You, you go Europe often, just like different, different countries. Yeah, yeah, I go to Europe. Europe is like going to Birmingham. Yeah, <laughs> just for yeah. like a day and coming back. Do you mind flights? <laughs> you know... Flights, I don't mind flights. If they're if they're short flights, I don't mind. You know, long flights. People like me struggle when you're tall, and they don't give you leg space. I always ask for leg space, but if they don't give you leg space, it's just it's terrible. And also, you have to be a. a also, it's better if it's Heathrow, isn't it? <laughs> oh no, Heathrow, definitely, definitely. I I can't, I hate flying from any other uh, uh, what do you call it, airport? Yeah. Stansted and Gatwick. It's too far. Stansted is not even London. I know. Do you know what? So the, the, it's because we're so close to Heathrow. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, I, and I remember you speaking to me about that before because you were going somewhere and, and I said, oh, where are you flying from? And you said, I only fly from Heathrow. Yeah. <laughs> and and, um, <laughs> and then... Because it's 15 minutes from my house. I know. And, but, yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's so convenient. 10 minutes if there's no traffic. Yeah. You can get it so quickly. So, so quickly. Um, the... I'm, so the the light upon light tour that we're doing in, in about a week or so that that I'll, I'll be asked to host, um, the, the it starts in Glasgow, uh-huh. and so they they're gonna fly they're me. They're flying. What were they wanting to fly me to Glasgow from Heathrow? I'm guessing. Let me tell you. I tell you the story that happened. So basically, <laughs> I, I, I went there to have the meeting with them. So we were just talking about logistics and stuff, and. Um, they said, okay, the first um, the first uh, show is in Glasgow. So what we'll do is we'll fly you out uh, straight to Glasgow. And then from there, you'll be like transported to the various different cities by car. Yeah. Mm. So uh, then as soon as they said that, like our mine and your conversation came to my head that we had about. And because I, I, I remember when we had that conversation, I was just, just thinking, wow, so yeah, yeah, so right. Like what, why would you make the F? Like it's just too... You have like the largest airport in the UK, ten minutes away, and you're gonna. I understand that. Big, it's cheaper. It's cheaper and stuff, but. But to be honest, you end up paying. Yeah. Uh, if you because sometimes you have a lot of luggage and it's very hard to take public transport, so you have to take a taxi. Yeah. To these far airports, and you end up paying the same amount that you thought was yeah you save on your ticket, but you end up paying like hundred pounds. Well, that happened to me recently. And time as well. And time because you know what happened to me recently, I had a flight from Stansted, and it was an early morning flight. It was I think six a.m. So that means I have to leave my house at like 2 a.m. in order to get there early enough to check in and to, you know, be comfortable and have enough time just in case anything could happen. So at 2 a.m., what public transport are you able to take? Yeah, so that yeah, I had okay. to take an Uber, okay, from here to Stansted. It costs £100. Allahu Akbar. £100. You would have just spent an extra 100 Okay, so, so, so yes, so you might as well just spend an extra £100. 
okay <laughs> two <laughs> now to get the flight from Heathrow well, f- for me I remember save me that hassle I remember driving um there to Gatwick once but then I paid to have my car leave my car there for like a week whereas if it's Heathrow there's so many people anyone will drop you to Heathrow because it's so close mm. so anyway they they um they said they'll fly me to Glasgow and I said to them look just one request <laughs> if you can just please book my ticket from Heathrow mm. because I said otherwise it's gonna just um you know get messy and then and then they ended up uh, they said yeah we'll, we'll book from Heathrow we know you're so close to there and and stuff and what happened is they messaged me about two days ago and they they showed me the flight and they were saying look it makes sense to book it from Gatwick <sighs> Jeff, I got the. I was on the phone. I saw the message like, that. Like, please, I said. So what we ended up doing is, um, uh, so they're not going to fly me to. I, I said, look, if, if if the option is because I think that the 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 different the other thing is that not a lot of planes go so close from Heathrow. A lot of them uh-huh. go from the small airports, and so um, I said, if it's going to be, if that's my option, I'd prefer to um, start the tour with you guys a day before. Mm-hmm. And then uh, at least that way I can just get the transport from the road from London because the tour starts, I think, a, a day before or something, but I was going to mm. start from Glasgow. Uh-huh. So I said, just uh, start me from Bradford and then I'll just... So mm-hmm. I'm going up from there. London uh, with them because that's the other thing. And he's, even on the tour, on the tours, I prefer not driving because mm-hmm. it's so it's such long drives and the events themselves take so much um, out of you. And then last thing you want to do is jump on the road and drive five, six hours. So no. I prefer just leave my car somewhere and then I'm just a passenger. It's like, you know, this is the, you know, traveling, traveling, the Prophet Ali Salatuna, he said that it's a safar or qat'atu min adab. It's like a part of punishment. It's like a part of punishment. You know, nowadays it's been, it's been very easy. It's, it has been made very easy. Yes. Oh, that came out. <laughs> oh, blood. <laughs> but uh, back in the time of, of our predecessors, it was very difficult to travel. Mm. Right, because you, you had to go from one on, on horseback, on camel, or sometimes walking far distances from country to country. It would take months and so on. And it was very hard. So on your journey, you would have to stop at many stops, many transits, right? You know, many layovers, <laughs> for days or months or whatever to gather your provisions again to carry on your journey. It's very difficult. But So how now it's been made easy. But on top of that, it's still slightly difficult sometimes. You know, there's difficulties that you go through. So, and that's why Allah, He grants us a lot of eases. What they call it concessions, ruchas. Okay, when it comes to um, things that have been made easy for you in terms of your ibad, uh, when, it, when you're traveling, for instance, you don't have to fast when you're traveling. Okay, you don't, um, you shorten your prayers and you can combine them when you're traveling, right? Because when you're traveling, generally it's very hard to pray on time because you, you know, you're on a journey, stopping all the time is difficult. So you combine the prayers and you can shorten them. When you're traveling, uh, you don't have to, because you're shorting prayers, you don't necessarily pray, pray the voluntary prayers. But you know the beautiful thing about that? The Prophet Ali Salatana he says that it is recorded for the slave uh, the good deeds that he used to do that he used to do when he was a resident and healthy. So when you're a traveller, right, you perhaps will not pray the sunan, but when you used to pray it when you're a resident normally and you don't pray as a traveller, you still get the good deeds without you even doing it. Wow. When you're sick, when you're sick, it's yeah, it's very difficult. For instance, if you used to fast every Monday, Thursday, or or every other day, or the three white days, or every month, etc., you used to fast, but now due to your health, you can't do it anymore. But because it was your habit, and you're not able to anymore, Allah Taala, you still get the reward without you even doing it, wow. because it was your habit. And that's the rahmah of Allah Taala. So traveling is one of those. And hasanat generally good deeds. Subhanallah, there are four levels. You intend a good deed, okay, and you do it, okay. You get ten good deeds and more, and seven seven hundred uh, folds. Or Allah Azza multiplies for every wishes. That's when you do it. You intend a good deed, and you don't do it, okay? Because you're not able to. For instance, you had some money, okay? You wanted to give to a masjid. You had a hundred pound. You want to take the masjid for charity. Give to charity. Or on the way, you lost a hundred pound. Okay, now you're not able to do it, right? So what happens? You still get the full reward. You uh, intended a good deed, okay? And you ended up not doing it without any excuse. You just end up not doing it. Just the fact that you intended it, you still get a full good, root, good deed. SubhanAllah, look. So in, in, intending good deeds and just intending them and trying to do your best to do them as well. And it's rahmah of Allah. And this is our ummah only gets that, by the way. 
the previous nations never used to have that, that the good deeds are multiplied like that because they used to have longer lifespans. So they had more time to do good deeds. But we have shorter lifespans, 60 to 70 years. So we only have a short period of time. So we, some of us could say, oh, it's not fair. We're only living 60 years. Some of them live for thousands of years, etc. So they had more time. We have less time, but our deeds are multiplied. And this is na'mah from Allah wa ta'ala. So it's utilizing it, especially in traveling. But there are certain deeds the Prophet ﷺ, when traveling, he would not leave. And the sunnah of Fajr, before Fajr he would pray two rak'ahs, and Witr before he sleeps. He would not leave it safran, safran wa hadhra. Yani when he's a resident and when he's a traveler, he would always observe uh, those sunan. Naam. I remember listening to a talk where, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh-huh. I remember listening to a talk where someone was talking about this argument that people sometimes make when they say, um, you know, because traveling is not as hard as it used to be, and we're not on, we're not traveling by camel or walking. You know, I don't, um, I don't use the concessions that Allah gave me. I remember listening to this talk, and and um, you know, you often hear stuff like, you know, if Allah is giving you a concession, you you take it, and or you often hear, you often hear about the idea that the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would choose the the easier of the two options. No. But what this Sheikh said was interesting because um, what he said is. That Who said this? Uh, that's what I can't remember Because yeah. I remember listening to it ages ago But I remember w- when watching this video Oh, it was a lesson, okay, a lecture I believe so, yeah Okay, now, nah. okay um, What he was saying was Just because you're not travelling by camel or walking That's not just the only difficulty you go through when travelling A lot also takes into account the fact that Just the fact that you're not at your own home mm-hmm. You're out of your general zone. You're out of your comfort zone And also you're, you're just your general habits Like you might have to wake up a bit earlier than you normally do Because you're travelling so you have more appointments <laughs> no. Or you might have to uh, You're not in your own bed And that causes a bit of like To the human like, a bit of like psychology issues You're not with your family So you don't have the same kind of confidence And I thought to myself SubhanAllah I've never reflected it on it, on it in that way Because I, I've always understood the idea that You know what If Allah has given you a concession You take it I've understood that element of it But I just never thought to myself SubhanAllah it is That, that is true Like you are You know mm. Maybe you're driving for a bit longer You're driving for seven hours And, and even though you're driving You're still You're not used to that every day mm-hmm. So I no. found that quite amazing Just when things were put into it a different is. context it's, 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 it's not about Oh it's difficult لا الله تبارك وتعالى has granted you a concession a رخصة you should take it Allah rather loves you take that than to make things difficult for you okay Allah عز وجل says يريد الله بكم النصر ولا يريد بكم العسر when Allah talks about fasting Allah wants ease for you he doesn't want difficulty for you right uh, and Allah عز وجل he mentioned those who are allowed to break their fast and so on traveler sick etc and so on فعدة من أيام أخر make it up another day Right? It's not like you're leaving the act of worship and so on. So it's very important that the individual, he does not make deen, our religion, Allah Taala has made it easy. And it's based upon ease. And the Prophet Ali he would say, yasiru wa la tu'asiru. He said, make things easy, no, make, don't make things difficult. And it's been reported, some of the ulama of the salaf, okay, when they would give fatwa, they would give fatwa to, based on ease, to make things easy for the people. But when it came to how they acted, they would be difficult themselves. They would be harsh upon themselves. And that's how the believer should be. And you make things easy for the ummah. Allah has granted ease. They don't tell them things that are hard. You have to, you have to do this. Generally, people, they, 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 you have to consider their, their circumstances and so on. And Allah, when He grants us things that are easy, that easy, okay, we as Muslims, in order to shukr to Allah, it's, it's, a way of, it's a way of showing gratitude that we take this ease. It's a ni'mah. Right, so you should take the ni'mah in order to show gratitude to Allah Taala, and Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, "Wa ma bin amati Rabbika fahadith." And as for the blessings of your Lord, huh? Make them apparent. Yani talk about them, make them apparent. Yani act upon them, and so on. These blessings of Allah Taala, and the Messenger Ali Salatu Salam says that Allah Taala, he loves to see his blessings upon his slave. Allah loves to see the blessings that he granted you apparent on you, right? Um, and it's a form of shukr, not to show off. Not to show pride and arrogance, like we mentioned earlier on. Because the Prophet Ali said in the hadith, the famous hadith, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر Whoever has an atom worth or master seed of, of arrogance in his heart, he will not enter Jannah. And the Sahaba were scared. Sahaba, you know the Sahaba, they, when they don't understand something, they would ask the Prophet Ali to clarify. So they say, Ya Rasulullah. They didn't question exactly what he said, but they gave him an example. They say, Ya Rasulullah. إِنَّ أَحَدَ لَا يُحِبُّ أَنْ يَكُونَ ثوب حسن ونعله حسنة. He said one of us. He likes to look good. He likes to dress his best, wear nice garments and nice shoes and so on. He said, is that arrogance? And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا لا لا. 
Inna Allah Jibir, you hibbul jama'a. Allah is beautiful, he loves beauty. And then he defined for them what arrogance is, and this is very important. He said, Al kibru batrul haq wa ghamtul nas. That it's rejecting the truth and to belittle the people. If you have that trait, if you even have an atom of that, an uh, atom worth of that in your heart, then that will prevent you from entering Jannah. Right, and the Prophet Ali Sultan, he demonstrated in his life <laughs> how uh, humble he was with every part of the community. Imagine the best of creation, the leader of the Islamic world, and he like the president in, in these terms, yani, to, uh, to help people understand. He'd be walking the streets of Medina, and then he'll see a woman who's a slave woman, weak, old. And then she'll see the Prophet Ali Sultan walking in Medina. You know what she says? Ya Rasulullah, li ilayka haja. Oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a request. So what does the Prophet Ali Sultan do? He stops. He doesn't say I'm too busy, etc. Or he doesn't send someone else to help her. No, he, him himself, he stops. And he listens to her. And you know what she does? You know, she, she, she doesn't consider the Prophet Ali Sultan, you know, he probably is busy. You know, he has so many things to attend to. You know what she does? She goes on and on and on. She talks about her whole life story. And the Prophet Ali Sultan just listens. He doesn't cut her off once. He doesn't disturb her, he doesn't interrupt her once. She goes on and on and on. And then after she's finished, she's done, she's run out of things to say. He says to her, listen. He says, here I am, Rasulullah. Take me to any of the streets of Medina you wish. And I'll fulfill your request. And then you know what she does? She takes me to the market. Then she takes me to, she takes me around a whole city. <laughs> Right? And the Prophet is with her, he's assisting her. Humility. Right? He will be walking the streets of Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he would be with the Sahaba. And he sees a young boy. His name was, he was the brother of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu. His name was Abu Umair. That's the kunya he was known for. The Prophet, alayhi wa sallam, look, look at the Prophet, alayhi wa sallam, how yani, involved he was in the Sahaba, in the community. He was aware of every single person's life and their situation and what they did and what they loved and what they. This young child, who people would think was just a young child, you know, I don't need to know anything about them. The Prophet ﷺ knew that this young boy had a bird, a sparrow that he used to play with. The Prophet knew that. So he saw the young boy crying one day. So what did he say? He said, because he noticed that the bird wasn't there. So the Prophet ﷺ sat with him, he saw him crying, he said, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'al al He called him by his kunya. And this is, and the Arabs generally, their favorite name is their kunya. So the Prophet is calling him by his favorite name. That's number one. A child. And then he says to him, And even his kunya, and, the, and the, what, he asks, What happened to the sparrow? The Prophet, he made it rhyme. Ya Aba Umair, ma nughair. It rhymes the way he asked the question. And then the kid, he said, What happened to the sparrow? Oh, Abu Umair. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ma ya Rasulullah. It died, O oh, Messenger of Allah. So what did the Prophet do? He sat with him and he comforted him until he completely forgot about the bird. Who, who gets that stage? Okay, look at the humility of the Prophet The best of creation, خير خلق الله. Imagine people who complain about the Prophet or who feel something negative towards the Prophet Did that happen time of the Prophet It did. Imagine after the Prophet conquered Mecca. Okay, that shows that look, no matter how high up you are, uh, no matter how yani, yani you think you are a scholar, you are a person who in, in, in position of authority, it doesn't matter. The Prophet who is better than every single one of us, this happened to him. After the conquest of Mecca, and this shows, look, this is a great lesson. And I always love to mention this. After the conquest of Mecca, a lot of those who are from Quraysh embrace Islam, who were late comers, but they embrace Islam. So after Fatah Mecca, the Prophet sallam, he went out to a battle called Hunayn. And those new Muslims, they want the Prophet Ali from Quraysh, they're from his tribe. They went out to the Prophet Ali from Ansar and so on. And after this battle, uh, a great number of Ghana'im, spoils of war, where they, ha- they had never been a, 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 that great large number in a previous battle. Okay? So, the Prophet Ali, what did he do? He distributed these spoils of war to the new Muslims. Why? To attract them to Islam. So that they can become firm upon Islam and so on. And this is from the guidance of the Prophet Ali, to help them to attack the yoke. So he gave them camels and this is like worth a lot of money. So who sees this? The Ansar. And the Ansar are not given anything. And they see this and they think, look, and look Shaitan. You know, at the end of the way, human beings. They think, look, the Prophet Ali now his people, Quraysh, they've embraced Islam. That's what they think. So they think, 
you know, now he's got his people back. He doesn't need us. And we're the ones who sacrificed everything. We helped him the whole way and we don't get anything. That's what they felt. And they discussed it amongst themselves. And they mentioned to leader Sa'ad ibn, uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Anhu. So what does Sa'ad do? Radiallahu anhu. He goes to the Prophet alayhi salatu and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Inna qawma kamil al-ansari qad wajadu alayk. He said, your people from the Ansar, they have felt something towards your messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلِمَا? Oh, he says, وَمَا, وَمَا ذَاكَ? He says, يعني, why? لِمَا? لِمَاذَا? Why? He said, they see you giving people all this wealth and you don't give them anything. And they are the ones who stood with you and aided you and they took you in you know, when you were exiled and so on. And they feel like, you know, you just completely disregarded them. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Sa'ad He said, وَمَا مُوْقِفُكَ أَنْتِ يَا سَعَدْ What's your position? Where do you stand in this, O oh, Sa'ad? <laughs> so Sa'ad now diplomatic. You know, what a says, difficult question to answer. It's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? So he, he's very diplomatic. He answered diplomatic. He says, إِنَّمَا أَنَا رَجُلٌ مِّنْ قَوْمِ He said, I'm a man for my people. <laughs> and what he means? I feel what they feel. My, my opinion is their opinion. So the Prophet Ali look what he does. He said, أَجْمِعْ الْأَنصَارِ Gather for me the Ansar. So now the Ansar is exclusive. Private meeting for the Ansar. The Prophet Ali when they come, he sees and he remembers the, the love and the compassion that's between them. And then he asks them, is there anyone amongst you who's not from the Ansar? To make sure this is exclusive to them. And they say, we're all from Ansar. He asks a second time. They say the same thing. He asks a third time. A young man gets up. He says, Ya Rasulullah, they are my maternal uncles. So the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, this is confusing, the sister of the people, son, is from them. <laughs> okay? So he told him to sit down. <laughs> okay? So the Prophet ﷺ, he started dragging the words out of his chest. So much emotion because he knew sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he only had a few months left, left in this world. Allah had revealed Surah Al Nasr. And Surah Al Nasr, Ida Nasr Allah al Fatih, the Mufassirun, they say that it indicates that the death of the Prophet is close. So he knows that he only has a few months left in this world with the Sahaba and he wants to, يعني, doesn't, leave, want to, doesn't want to leave on bad terms. So he's dragging the words out of his chest with so much emotion. And he says, What is it that I've heard about you, Ansar? He says to them, Have I not come to you misguided and Allah wa ta'ala guided you through me? And this is a lesson that the believer sometimes can mention his favors upon others in order to and rectify a problem, solve a problem. Okay, like the husband can do with his wife and the wife can do with the husband. It's permissible. Okay, and he said, did I not come to you misguided and Allah Azza wa Jalla guided you through me? And they said, yes, and to Allah and his message belong all favors. And he said, did I not come to you disunited? And Allah united you through me? And they said, yes, and to Allah and his message belong all favors. And he said, did I not come to you weak and Allah wa ta'ala and he granted you strength through me. And they said, yes. And they said the same thing. And they said, did not come to you poor? And Allah answered, enrich you through me. And they said the same thing, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ went quiet. And that was the custom of the Arabs. If one of them mentioned what he's done for someone else, he would wait for them to say what they done for the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't respond. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't respond to Ansar. They didn't respond. Rather, they were crying. They were emotional. They thought, what have we done? The Prophet ﷺ done all this for us. And we're just... You know, over wealth, we're, we're, we're feeling this negativity towards the Prophet. And the Prophet was just. It's very important that he just. He said, If you wished, he said, You could say things that you've done for me, and you would be truthful, and everyone would believe you. He responds on their behalf. He said, You could say, You came to us exiled, we took you in. You came to us not married. The Prophet ﷺ went to Medina, he wasn't married because Khadija had passed away and we married you off. You came to us uh, betrayed and we supported you, we aided you. And if you said that, you'd be truthful and everyone would believe you. Right? And they're crying and say, What should we say, O Messenger of Allah? Lillahi wa rasuli al minna tulfad. To Allah and His Messenger belong with favors. At the end, the Prophet ﷺ, to cut the story short, because it's long, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, Ya Ma'ash al-Ansar, have you felt towards the Prophet ﷺ over worldly gain, a camel, sheep, cows, whatever, that I give to these people, to attract them to Islam, and I entrusted you with the Iman. He said, O oh, Ansar, does it not please you that you take back with you, these people, they take back with them these, all this wealth, this worldly gain, he, he says, Lu'a'ati min al-dunya, he makes it make seem insignificant. And he says, وَتَذْهَبُونَ أَنْتُمْ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. And you take back with you the Messenger of Allah عليه الصلاة والسلام to Medina. He said, for Wallahi, I swear by Allah, what you're taking back is better than what these people are taking back. And then he said, النَّاسُ دِثَارُ وَالْأَنصَارُ شِعَارُ He said, the people, they're distant from me. And the Ansar are the closest to me. And then he made dua for them. And then the Ansar, they, they realized how wrong they were. And the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام, look how he solved the situation. And that's from humility, صلى الله عليه وسلم. That he didn't think that, how dare they think this about me? La, at the end of the day, they're human beings. And you must 
any understand that and you must deal with the situation with wisdom and that's what the prophet Ali he teaches, he teaches us that he dealt with every matter with wisdom and that's why Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he tells in the Quran لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا in the messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu salam is the best example and for us to follow him in every part of his life literally every uh, every scenario that we could be in The Prophet ﷺ has gone through it in his life You will find an example in the life of the Prophet ﷺ Look how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with it And you find a solution for yourself Now, I just went on and on and on Why didn't stop me, yeah, Sheikh? No, 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 it was important <laughs> I, I want to stop you, Sheikh It was important uh, But um, it is the winter months And that means that the Salah is very, very um, close together So we do have to come to an end So we can make sure we catch Dhuhr uh, But Jazakallah Khair uh, Ustad for joining me once Allah again uh, on, on Freshly Grounded And um, it took some convincing But we got there in the end Alhamdulillah I wanted to give it You know what my initial plan was Last uh, The last time I came on here was around It was 2018 wasn't it? it was I, so. I think it's about April Around that time I believe so Okay so I wanted to wait until April 2020 <laughs> to give it time. <laughs> Once you beat me, Allah, understand? Alhamdulillah. We got the, Overp- we overpowered got the, me. No, I, I, it took for me to turn up outside your house <laughs> and bring you here myself. <laughs> Allah, understand. Jazakallah uh, khair. Jazakallah khair, honestly, for, uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, as I always say, and I believe that the podcast, this Fresh Ground podcast, it is... It's, it's very important that people they have uh, places like this because, and I, I believe I said this last time as well because it adds value to the lives of people and I've, and we've seen the benefit that it's had on other people's lives and this is what uh, Islam is all about. It is about benefiting others. It is about being beneficial to others. The Messenger Ali sallallahu alaihi he says, "Al mu'minu kanahla." He said, "The believer is like the huh? the bee." And he says in another in another narration, "Al mu'minu kanahla." He said, "The believer is like the the date tree." And there's reasons for this. First of all, the example is of the bee. The bee. We need to be like the bee. What do we know about the bee? The Prophet ﷺ said, It doesn't consume except what is pure. And everything the bee takes in, it is pure. Nectar, pollen, it's all pure. right? And then it does not produce except that which is pure. Honey and so on, which is beneficial to others. It takes in that which is beneficial to it and it produces what is beneficial to others. Honey and so on. And on top of that, so it, the believer should be a person he only consumes that which is halal. He only listens to what is permissible. He and so on. What he intakes is pure, so that what he produces is pure. Because what you produce, it depends on what you take on, take in, right? That's how what your production depends upon. And uh, the believer, he's beneficial to others. What the bee does, it benefits others. That honey is a cure in it. Allah says, "Fihi shifa." In it is a cure, yani honey, for mankind, and so on. And also from the benefits is the bee it it, it 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 works it unites with the other bees it works together right it teaches us al-amal al-jama'i to work with others and to cooperate with them in that which is good and that's what Allah tells us وَتَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْإِثْمِ الْعُدْوَانِ assist each other and aid each other upon what? righteousness and God consciousness and do not assist each other upon evil and uh, and, uh, and enmity so the bee, it unites with the other bees too. It builds its hive. It, they do this work together. They all work together, etc. And from the bee, you learn also organizational behavior. The bee, it follows a line of command or chain of command, they call it. Yes. They have the queen bee and they all follow that, that chain of command. Whatever is told, etc. does it. Yani, the believer does not engage in chaos. He's organized. He's planned. He has a plan, etc. That's how the believer should be. And on top of that, the lesson, like just one example, there's so many that lessons that can be taken from the Prophet Alistair when he gives, that's why it's so profound. He, the Prophet Alistair, he says like the, the believers like the bee because the bee, it sacrifices sometimes itself for other bees. It will put its, li- its life on the line for other bees. And that's how the believer is. Just my, by knowing you, know you now, I would do anything to benefit you because you're my, belie- you're my, 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 my brother in faith. In Islam And that's the only bond I was saying to you last night You know, The only bond that does that Is Islam Right You meet someone for the first time And This person You love them Like you love yourself Or sometimes You love for them Everything that you love for yourself And you want You go out your way For that individual No other bond does that Except Islam mm. And the other hadith Which is that the believers Like the nakhla The Date tree The date tree The reason why The Prophet Ali oh, There's many examples But I will just mention one Every single part of the date tree, it is beneficial. Even the trunk, it is used. Nothing is thrown in the bin. Meaning that a believer, every part of him should be beneficial. So your podcast, it does that. Right? 
يعني this is the age of social media and media and so on and young people especially they require things like this يعني people and your lovely guests who come on here who benefit others in all different يعني يعني parts of life and it's, it's it's very important and this is these are sort of a'mal the deeds that يوم القيامة the individual and he hopes that Allah تبارك وتعالى he puts on his scale of good deeds because these are a'mal jabbara they're great deeds that a person he he's engaged in is an act of worship with the right intention Allah tabarak wa ta'ala will grant you great reward at yawm al qiyama you know uh, the poet he says about ilm knowledge he says i've called you to knowledge takunu bihi imam and you'll be with us an imam the objective of knowledge is not to be a, an imam a person who has an authority that's not objective knowledge what he means here it is that the knowledge that you have you'll be a person who because of your knowledge others will imitate you in good because of knowledge that you have and that's knowledge it will lead to people doing good and khair and then you have records of good deeds huh yawm al qiyamah that you did not do you stand yawm al qiyamah and you say ya allah where did this come from huh because of the knowledge that's the virtuous knowledge so you know providing a platform like this for yourself and others you know to and he pass on information and knowledge that will benefit people in their lives in the akhirah it is one of the greatest things that you can do the prophet ali sultan says man da'a ila huda Whoever calls towards huh, goodness and guidance and khair, he has the reward of everyone who follows him. And that does not decrease any of their rewards either. Allahu Akbar. So may Allah wa ta'ala reward you and make this a platform that testifies for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Right? Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day that no wealth and no offspring will benefit for the deeds or benefit. We ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to put barakah in it and we ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala to allow you to benefit uh, many 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 others yani, that perhaps he hasn't reached she go further and further yani. and uh, Jazakallah khair for the opportunity I'm sorry that I go on and on and you probably get tired of hearing my voice because I get tired of hearing my voice so I'm sure you probably do as well Jazakallah khair Allah <laughs> Jazakallah khair